All right. Our last speaker for today is uh, Richard Vega. He's coming from Texas A&M, um, studying computational neutron transport. His advisor is Marvin Adams, and he's in his fourth year of the fellowship. His practicum, oh, he did two practicums, Lawrence Livermore National Lab in 2016 and Sandia, um, New Mexico in 2018. And he will be telling us about transport sweeps using an extended slice balance approach with LEFU and GPU. LG, oh, LGFU, okay. LG, yeah. Okay. So as she said, I'll be talking about transport sweeps using an extended slice balance approach with linear discontinuous finite elements and GPU acceleration. So I'll begin with an introduction. In the field of nuclear engineering, we're very concerned with this linear Boltzmann transport equation. It's pretty nice to be able to tell people about my research in like one sentence. I'm basically just trying to solve this equation. That's it. it in the end, it's a lot more complicated than that, but it's, it's easily summed up. So we have a time-dependent term, and then a streaming operator, and then a collision operator on the left, and then we have a scattering term and an external source term on the right. Now, fortunately, this scary equation can be brought down significantly after applying time discretization, the multigroup energy discretization, an iterative method for the scattering term, and also a discrete ordinance approximation. And in the end, after applying all of those things, each of which could be you know, the subject of many dissertations by itself, we're left with a spatially dependent um, partial differential equation. And we basically have the streaming plus collision operator operating on the angular flux, and that equals some steady state source. So we just iteratively, iteratively solve this equation for n angles and g energy groups. And that looks pretty simple as well until, <laughs> until you consider that we're solving this for every angle in a, in a angular quadrature set. And we typically would use something like the finite element method or the typical cell balance like finite volume method to solve this. And in that sense, we're just inverting that streaming plus collision operator on every cell of our mesh. So in this case, if we had an angle in this direction shown here, we would have the flux coming in on the bottom of the cell, flux coming in on the left of the cell, and then the flux coming out of the top and on the right are both functions of those fluxes coming into the cell. There is an issue, however, in that the flux entering this side of the cell should not influence the flux exiting the right side of the cell because scattering is taken care of in the iterative, iterative method and there's no way particles can stream from the left to the right. So that's something that all cell balance methods are going to kind of smear. And as a result, uh, Robert Grove back in the early 90s developed what was called the slice balance approach in which you take sort of a characteristic method and define it explicitly. So you, you basically make slices out of all your cells by um, defining all the points in a cell that share the same inlet and outlet faces when projected through that point in the direction vector of your, of your ordinate. And this improves accuracy due to increased spatial resolution, as you might expect, but also because it has a more uh, consistent representation of particle streaming, because now the flux entering on this face is only carried by the flux being solved for in this slice, and hence it only affects the flux on the top face. So you solve independently on each of these three slices. It also adds concurrency. I mean, it has more work, but it adds concurrency as well, so there's more opportunities for parallelism. And in 3D, Things get only slightly more complicated as shown on the bottom right with the angle pointing into the screen and the overlap of the inlet and outlet face cause um, the slice to be that's shown in the middle. So this improved things, but it's by no means a panacea. Uh, you could envision a situation where you had two of these cells, one on top of the other, and the flux entering on the left is used in slice one, flux entering on the bottom of this slice is used in slice two, those two outgoing fluxes are combined to give the flux exiting the top face, and then that's used as the incoming flux to slice two prime and slice three prime. But particles should not be able to stream from this left face in slice one and enter slice three prime. So we have flux smearing on the faces in our mesh. Um, so a little later I'm gonna talk about how we solve that. But for right now, let's talk about parallel transport sweeps. The way we solve this typically is on many processors, each square um, in this picture is a different subset of the mesh just designated to a certain node of the supercomputer. 
and you would have what are called sweeps where you you um, propagate for a certain angle, you sweep throughout the mesh. So in stage one, for an angle in this quadrant, um, the, only, the only subset of cells that has all its incoming uh, flux information on the boundary and hence predefined is this guy, and then same thing for these angles in the corners as well. And then they would solve for all the cells in their subset, pass the boundary information to their neighbors, and then they would start going. In reality, there would be another angle in this uh, quadrant that would start behind it, and it would start solving in this stage. Um, the reason we want to do this is because if we can move all the parallelization to the inner iteration, meaning the solution of the spatially dependent problem, then the scattering iteration count and the um, the outer outer and inner iterations take about the same amount of time or the same number of iterations. So you can focus all your energy on parallelizing that one part of the problem. That's not true of something like parallel block Jacobi. Um, it's also been proven to be scalable to over a million cores, which is very nice. And then cons, obviously, not all geometries are going to be easily divisible by uh, interprocessor domain boundaries. Even if they were, you're really not guaranteed any kind of load balancing. And also, you have this idle time at the beginning of your sweep where all these processors in the middle are just waiting for information to get to them. And then again, at the end, when all the angles are sweeping out towards the end, all the processors in the middle are again idle. So that puts a cap on your parallel efficiency. If you have enough angles in your angle set, that's not really a problem. But let's move on to some theory. So we wanted to modify the SBA by adding the concept of a subslice. So a subslice is just the region of a slice that's downstream of a single slice in the upstream cell. So here's slice one, and the region in slice two prime that is downstream of slice one is subslice two prime one, and likewise the region of, sub, of slice two prime that is downstream of slice two is subslice two prime two. Uh, slice one prime and slice three prime in this case are not um, cut into subslices, but on a more complicated mesh this is a little more difficult. So the incoming flux information now is stored on the subslice. So this is how we fix that flux smearing issue. Right, so we solve in slice one. Slice one only has this subslice downstream and we store the flux on this face right here. Slice two has these two subslices. I mean, this is a subslice, but it's also a slice. Right, so we store the incoming flux on those two. And then when we go to solve slice two prime, we just appropriately merge the fluxes entering the two subslices. So we don't have that flux smearing. We're, what we're doing effectively is smearing on the inlet faces of the slices and not the faces of the mesh. So what this should do is give us better accuracy in problems that have shadow type discontinuities. Um, you could think of rays of particles, uh, shielding problems where you have maybe ducts, stuff like that. Um, so this is really geared towards a specific type of problem. And also by making that modification, we can add to the definition of the slice by just saying that no slice can straddle an arbitrary cut plane that the user can choose. So I've shown a tetrahedral mesh here on the left, and I've just decided, okay, my angle points into the page, I'm just gonna draw these random cut planes, and I add, the, add to the definition of the slice that no slice straddles a cut plane, so the slice that was made by this inlet face and outlet face now turns into two slices. Now what that has the effect of is it makes the solution in every um, pipe region here completely independent of any other. So we're adding more concurrency. It gives us more opportunity for parallelization. And I'll show that in a little bit as well. I'm going to skip through this in the interest of time. And if you don't know linear discontinuous finite element method, now isn't the time to learn it. <laughs> and if you do, you've already seen this. So. All right, so on to parallelization. To illustrate the two parallelization options that are made possible by this type of pipe discretization or uh, pipe separation of the mesh that I should just showed you before I skip through all that nonsense. Um, imagine this mesh here where we have two materials meshed with different resolutions. The first parallelization option is going to be similar to the traditional transport sweep. We're going to domain decompose. I've developed an algorithm that does load balancing, so you'll notice that these lines don't line up exactly. That's because 
the algorithm tries to put these cut planes in, in a particular location that you have the same amount of cells on each node of your supercomputer. So each color here is assigned to a different node of the supercomputer. And then on the right, what I'm showing you is the definition of tasks in this parallelization option. So a task is defined as an inlet face or an inlet patch, like here or even this little segment here is a patch. And you project that through the subset of the mesh in the direction of omega, and that provides those cut planes, and now each of those tasks is completely independent of any other task. And what happens there is that now your sweep ordering looks a lot different, right? You're no longer waiting, or all these cells anyways, are no longer waiting at the beginning of the sweep. The all, all five cells on the lower left corner have some information that they can start going, and what this does is reduces the idle time in the uh, sweep dependency graph. And then, so the red tasks go first, and then the blue tasks and the green tasks and so forth. You still have your idle time at the end of your sweep dependency graph. This was not imaginative enough. So we also came up with parallelization option two, which uses some sort of arbitrary domain decomposition. In this case, the Scotch algorithm that is pre-programmed into open foam. And um, what it tries to do is separate where the solution is obtained and where the solution is stored. So just because the orange node owns this cell doesn't mean that the or that, that node of the supercomputer has to solve for the flux in that cell. So we're trying to separate the relation between the two. And the way we do that is by drawing these cut planes in the direction of omega, shown here, and then each of those tasks become, becomes completely independent. And you could think if you had eight um, nodes, like in this case, and you wanted to split each angle into four pipes, then you could do two angles at a time and so forth, right? So that's eight tasks that you can do at a time with eight nodes. But, you know, you would have the first four nodes working on those four tasks and maybe the other four nodes working on the four tasks for the next angle in your quadrature set all at the same time. So it eliminates the two cons that I had on the, the page showing cons for the parallel transport sweeps in that you no longer need planar internode domain boundaries. You can get perfect load balancing because Scotch's, Scotch algorithm is very good at that. And you also have no idle time. The downside of to it, of course, is that you're communicating volumetric information instead of boundary information between the nodes of your supercomputer. So you end up having larger messages but fewer of them. So you're going to pay the, the message passing latency fee less times, but you're going to have significantly larger messages. So moving on to some preliminary results, we wanted to first check the accuracy of the method. So we are using a manufactured solution, uh, nice and smooth, just the product of signs. We are using this cell averaged L2 error norm shown here with uniform material properties, isotropic scattering, one energy group, and an S4 angular quadrature set. And what we see is there's a lot of information being displayed on here. So the dots colored in blue are the typical cell balance. So that's just your standard LDFM. Then you have the SBA, which is the traditional slice balance approach, and then the extended slice balance approach developed here. This has nothing to do with the parallelization. It's just checking the accuracy. The C in this case is the scattering ratio. We wanted to see if increasing the scattering would be more detrimental for something like a slice balance or an extended slice balance approach, because in the end, the scattering source is still cell-wise, not slice-wise. So if you have a lot of scattering, you could think your, your source is only given on a cell-wise basis, so how accurate can you really be if your source isn't unique to each slice? But it, it turns out that up to uh, half scattering anyways, it's, it's not really that significant. Um, so we see that the LD methods all have the third order convergence and the diamond difference methods. I didn't display diamond difference earlier, but it's basically just a finite volume uh, method. And then what we wanted to do next was look at the discontinuous convergence order because as I mentioned earlier, this method should really excel when you have um, shadow type discontinuities or discontinuities of any type really. But in particular, this type of discontinuity where you have a source on the maybe the bottom face of your mesh and it's in a particular angle where it just 
goes up to the top of the mesh and you have this, you know, this ray basically of particles. Again, we're using the same uh, L2 relative error norm, uniform material properties, no scattering, single energy group, uh, gauss chebyshev angular quadrature. And what we see is that the extended slice balance approach for both the diamond difference and linear discontinuous finite elements both retain their, um, their convergence orders, except this went down to 2.9. Um, but these are starting to converge out to here. We've gathered more data, but they're just converging very slowly. And we're also looking at changing this to a um, point-wise L2 norm instead of a cell-wise L2 norm to see if we can uh, more further restrict the convergence study. And then we wanted to look at just plain ray propagation in 2D. This was motivated by Kirk Matthews in the late 90s. He basically did this problem where you had a 25 by 25 centimeter domain. Um, you had a single um, angle for your quadrature set, and it was incident on a single face of um, the cell at the origin. And the cross sections are as follows. So what we see here when we're just using regular cell balance, we get an awful result for diamond difference. People don't use diamond difference really, so that's okay. Um, Linear discontinuous, it's, it's a pretty good result, but this should really be the width of one of these cells, and it's not. And it's never gonna be, but it's still better. If we apply the slice balance, what we see is that we got rid of the lateral oscillations from the diamond difference method, which is great, but it's still really diffuse. And this, again, this is traditional slice balance, so we've improved on both of these methods. We still have lateral oscillations in the linear discontinuous case, though. And if we apply the extended slice balance, we see that the peaks get sharper, the lateral oscillations go down. In the case of LD, they were already gone for diamond difference. So this at least gives us a um, qualitative understanding of, of what the extended slice balance is doing. Um, we have preliminary weak scaling data for parallelization option two, which was the crazy method where you tried to separate where the solution is obtained versus where it's stored. And what we see is that the weak scaling goes up, or the parallel efficiency goes up as you add more angles to your angle set. That means the more angles that you're sweeping simultaneously. Um, and this makes sense because you're, you're, cu you're cutting the, the mesh less times and you're introducing less cells by doing that. But this was 125,000 cells per node. Each node had 16 cores. This went out to, I think, 30 something, 100 cores, and we were still at about 80% parallel efficiency, which is good for now. Um, accelerating this with the GPU, there is an issue in the linear discontinuous finite element method with a slice balance approach, because the slices in your mesh are unique to every angle and every, or unique to every angle in your quadrature set. So if you think of, you know, having 100,000 cells, and a thousand angles and several, you know, hundred kilobytes of information per slice that you need to store in the form of volume integrals and surface integrals and material properties, you're quickly gonna run out of memory and you just can't store all of it in, in memory and just keep reusing it. So you're basically gonna have to compute it, use it, throw it away, and every time you sweep, do that again. It's a big problem if, as in this picture, <laughs> that stuff that you're computing and throwing away every time takes 90% of your runtime. But if you use a GPU, and this is just a standard gaming GPU for a laptop, you can knock down that, uh, that runtime significantly, and perhaps if you pipelined it to where the CPU was doing the top part right there, while the GPU was doing all the slice construction in the background, you could just, you know, hide it all together. Um, finally, my advisor asked me to do a real-world problem. I mean, all these nice little, you know, one-energy group, simple manufactured solutions are great. So I came up with, well, what if my dog were made out of plutonium as a volume source? <laughs> that was not accepted, um, but it makes, it makes a good slide. So this is the source, that's my dog, and that's the scalar flux at the mid-plane of my dog. <laughs> Like I said, I have to think of a better real-world problem. 
And in conclusion, the extended SBA retains the convergence order of the linear discontinuous finite element spatial discretization for smooth problems, and it also increases the accuracy for problems with sharp discontinuities. It um, also adds two new parallelization sweep strategies that either reduce or eliminate the idle time and allow for arbitrary domain decompositions in one of them, and both allow for nearly perfect load balancing, and both, although I only showed results for one, are showing decent weak scaling studies uh, or weak scaling results out to 3,000 cores. Uh, the GPU can be used to accelerate the building of the slices and subslices and perhaps hidden altogether if pipelined with the CPU. And both the traditional SBA and the extended SBA are able to handle arbitrary polyhedral unstructured meshes, such as my dog. Okay, um, I'd like to thank, in, in this particular case, the bottom half of this screen I'd like to focus on. The fellowship has been amazing, so many great opportunities, and I just, I couldn't be more thankful for all the guidance and help that I've gotten through this. I'd also like to thank, obviously, Texas A&M and Sandia, where I've been a year-round intern for the past six years, I think, ish. And with that, I will take questions.